Good evening and welcome to the Q&A show live and interactive with myself, Cyrus. And tonight we've got Dr. Grady on the line. Dr. Grady, are you there? I am, sir. It's good to see your smiling face. So nice to see you. and Thank you so much indeed for joining us tonight, Grady. And a reminder to our viewers, we are live, we're interactive. And this program is about our viewers, their questions, their emails, their SMS. So the view details are going to be on screen. So send us your questions live at revelationtv.com. SMS details will be on screen. So Dr. Grady, just to start things off, there's something I'd, I'd like to talk to you about. And that's the volcano that's currently going on on La Palma, the Canary Islands of Spain. And um, over the past eight days, 7,000 people have been forced to leave their homes to escape rivers of lava cascading from La Palma's er erupting volcano in one of Spain's Canary Islands. The untrained eye, it sounds like thunder, but locals who remember the last eruption 50 years know better. Scientists say pressure inside the volcano has decreased, but that doesn't mean that the eruptions are about to stop. Scientists have been close to follow, following the tremors that preceded and could go on for weeks and if not months. Have you seen this particular story in the US and what do you make of this, Grady? I have not seen the story much covered in the United States press, but it is normal for the Canary Islands. They're volcanic islands. And these eruptions occur every so often. It's relatively normal. Of course, the eruption is going to be reducing the forces inside. Remember that the eruptions are not caused by hot rock exploding. The eruptions themselves are caused by the hot water coming up with the hot rock, turning from supercritical water, that's liquid water above 100 degrees Celsius, um, and exploding the way a pressure cooker that doesn't hold on explodes in a kitchen. And so as that water comes up and it turns to steam, it causes these eruptions throwing the ash, steam, and lava coming up with it out. But of course, as the water ceases or, or diminishes, the forces of that explosive force diminish. But the flow of lava could continue for a long time. Grady, there's also another story that I'd just like to, to ask you about. And there was an article in the, in the Daily Mirror recently in the United Kingdom. And let's just show the front page headline. And it says, if we don't act now, this is our future. The story goes on to say the climate crisis often seems like a distant threat, melting polar ice caps or something that future generations will need to find a solution to. While the British weather has always been changeable, events previously considered rare or unprecedented are now becoming more common or more extreme due to global warming. In the past 12 months, the UK has faced severe floods, extreme temperatures, increased coastal erosion and wildfires on moors. The UK is already getting extreme weather with 2020, the third warmest, fifth wettest and eighth sunniest year on record. Grady, what do you make of this particular article? This is the typical environmental terrorist uh, opportunity. Uh, as one of our very far left wing politicians once said, never waste a good crisis. You see, what they've done is they've exaggerated any event to fit their political view. The fact of the matter is that we have just been experiencing for about the last 20 years, a slow cooling period on the earth uh, that has just passed the pivot point about six months ago, maybe nine months ago. Um, sunspot activity has started to come back again. Uh, I'll also point out that, um, you know, liars can figure and figures can lie. Now, it is not true that the polar ice caps are melting. Uh, this is simply a lie propagated by the far left. This is a political agenda, it is not science. The fact is that the polar ice caps are actually enlarging at this time. Now, much of the enlargement is thickness, not surface area. And so they might say, well, the polar ice caps are smaller in surface area, but they say nothing about the fact that they're thicker and therefore the public gets deceived. As a matter of fact, uh, 
course, we are now heading into a, a winter time in the northern hemisphere. Uh, the Arctic ice cap, which is simply the ice floating on water, uh, actually reached uh, a, a larger area than it had in the last few years this past winter. Mm -hmm. And uh, one wonders if it won't be the same this coming one, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, the reason for it, all of the sunshine, all of the rain, has nothing to do with global warming. What it has to do with, uh, and, and when I say it has nothing to do with global warming, I'm talking about it has nothing to do with human activity mm -hmm. causing global warming. Right. But the Earth does warm and cool over gradual cycles. These are normal, natural cycles. What is happening is the Earth is starting to warm very slightly due to a natural cycle. And what is happening is that weather patterns are shifting from the east back to the west on the surface of the earth. And so the, the rain that you had, and I know about the flooding in Europe and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, but that flooding uh, is rain that should have been actually out over the Atlantic, but shifted to the east over Europe due to global cooling. But as the earth does warm under a natural warming cycle, those weather patterns are shifting back to the west. And so this is a temporary situation. Of course, England is always eroding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anybody who knows anything about your North Sea coast or parts of your White Cliffs of Dover know that the erosion is occurring, but this is natural tidal action. It has nothing to do with global warming. Pete has written in a question here, Dr. Grady, and says, could you please ask, the doc ask Dr. Grady, if it's true that reducing carbon levels would do more harm than good to our environment? If so, how does he suggest us as Christians address this issue with climate change activists? Well, the fact of the matter is that these environmental terrorists, and that's the way I'm going to label them, are evolutionists. They do not believe in a God who's in control of things. And they are trying to reduce carbon emissions because they say, Carbon dioxide is a uh, gas which warms the earth. And that's true, it does, but it's a minor player. The fact of the matter is that water vapor in the atmosphere warms the earth far more than carbon dioxide. You know, when you take a look at the percentage of carbon dioxide, it's really minimal. Mm -hmm. uh, right now it's at about 400 parts per million. And I love doing mission work in the UK because you have this wonderful expression Let's do the maths. <laughs> and if you think about it, carbon dioxide does have a slight warming effect. However, it is pretty marginal. Uh, water vapor has a bigger effect. And of course, there are some other chemicals that have uh, a warming effect. But the truth of the matter is that by trying to reduce carbon dioxide, these environmental terrorists are doing great, great damage. Just ask yourself a question. Mm -hmm. What do plants use to make food? Mm -hmm. Well, it's carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. What do trees uh, use to make lumber? Well, it's carbon dioxide. And so by reducing carbon levels, in effect, they will ultimately starve millions and millions of people to death. The fact of the matter is that the earth is always better off when it is warming because crops become arable further north and further south on the hemispheres. Uh, for example, there in England, uh, you know, if you know anything about Hadrian's Wall, you'll know that the Romans were growing grapes for wine at Hadrian's Wall at the time that it was built. Uh, roughly, we'll say, and I don't remember the exact date, but somewhere in the areas of uh, around 130. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was much warmer in England at that time. It was the Roman warm period. Now, the Roman warm period uh, was a very nice time on Earth, and it had a great prosperity. Uh, remember also the, the medieval warm period when the Vikings were able to colonize Greenland. So actually, while I personally don't like global warming, I like it cool, personally. But the fact of the matter is that when the Earth warms, we have prosperity, we have less disease, we have less, uh, well, pandemics, I'll throw that in. 
Um, but it's a prosperous time on Earth when the Earth warms. But when the Earth cools, we have disastrous conditions. For instance, after the Roman warm period, which was a very good time on Earth, we had the two dark ages that followed later. Now, the two dark ages were called dark ages not because people lost knowledge. Actually, it was a great time of technological development. The reason the Dark Ages were called the Dark Ages is because it was dark and it was cold and it was a bad time to live on Earth in the sense of the environment. So people are far better off. The Earth is far better off when it is warming. And in terms of the sequestering of carbon dioxide, for instance, like the laws in Norway, we would be much better off if we released that carbon dioxide into the environment. Mm -hmm because the crops and the trees would simply absorb the carbon dioxide and produce beneficial products. After all, if you think about it, we produce carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. So what is one of the things that these environmental terrorists want? They want to have zero population growth. Mm. Why? To reduce carbon dioxide. So many emails coming in, Grady. Uh, Tony's written in talking about today will, you'll be with me in paradise. And he's saying, good evening, Cyrus and Grady. When Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise, I was thinking about Jesus, not yet glorified and not in heaven until the third day or after his death, the resurrection and resurrection. And how can this be? And does this thief on the cross mean that we don't have to be baptized unless we are able? That's from Tony. Every Christian should desire to be baptized as soon after salvation, I would suggest, as possible. However, there are situations, uh, perhaps in a hospital, perhaps in an accident, uh, when somebody does not have an opportunity after salvation to get baptized. But remember that baptism, though very important to Christianity, is not the salvation issue. The salvation issue is, have you accepted Christ as Lord and Savior? But everybody should be baptized if they can be. Now, the thief on the cross is an excellent example of the fact that even though he died without being baptized, he did die with saving faith because he recognized Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Now, paradise. Paradise existed from the time of creation to the time of the resurrection as part of the underworld. It was not a bad place. It was just a department of the underworld. We might think of it as a warehouse for the Old Testament saints. Because though they had saving salvation faith, they could not go to heaven until the resurrection had occurred, which provided the way in which they could go to heaven. And when Jesus died, he would go to paradise for a short time, and that one thief. The other one went to Gehenna hell. But the one thief went to paradise with Jesus. He's there for two and a half days. And then the Bible tells us that at the time of the resurrection, Jesus took captivity free. This is a reference to when Jesus moves paradise from the underworld to heaven. Mm -hmm. Now, there were some Old Testament saints who stopped in Jerusalem on the way and walked around glorifying God and then went to heaven a little later but the vast majority of those in paradise were moved directly to heaven. And today, the paradise doesn't exist for us as Christians because when we die, we instantaneously go to heaven. There's no stopping. There's no warehouse. So I hope that that kind of answers both questions that were being asked. Thank you, Grady. Mike's written a question to say, Hi, Osiris and Dr. Grady. The scripture says that to be absent from the body is to be with the Lord um, and it applies to evil people as well as good ones. So this can't mean you are physically with God at the time, can it? Thanks from Mike. It's interesting that it's sort of a good follow on question to the one we just had. <laughs> now, of course, Paul tells us that now that the resurrection has occurred, paradise doesn't exist and that when we die, we go immediately to be with the Lord if we are believers. Now. Evil people do not. The, the soul and spirit of evil people immediately go to hell. The body will be resurrected later and so forth, but they don't go to heaven. 
only the believer's soul and spirit will go to heaven. Now, you can read about that both in the Old Testament as well as the New. And one reference to that in the Old Testament is go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. Uh, but that is consistent with what Paul also tells us in the New Testament. So I don't know why anybody would think that evil people would go to heaven. They don't. Uh, Day's written in a question here saying, Hi both. In some of the pyramids in Egypt and South America, there are drawings of rocks and spacemen. And if there are no such things as aliens, would you uh, would, uh, would, would uh, be provoked them into drawing them? What would provoke them into drawing them? How did they uh, know that in their heads needed to be rounded helmets with an airy supply? Um, they must have known that this space, there was no air and all those thousands of years ago. Is this one of those things that God has not told us about as more than once? You said that God can probably only told us what he wants us to know. That's from Dave. Well, Dave, I think you're mistaken uh, in your very premise. The Bible is exact. There are no such things as aliens uh, that live in other planets, uh, other solar systems. Uh, the Bible tells us, for instance, in Psalm 115, this is the only place where human beings live or any creature like us, uh, a sentient being that experiences sin and salvation. Also in the New Testament, we're told that Christ came here and died once for all. Now, only God can use the word all and have it be absolute. And so if we think about it, if there were alien creatures that could experience sin and salvation, in order to fulfill God's righteousness, Jesus would have to go there and die for them too. But the Bible precludes that. Secondly, it sounds to me like you've been influenced a lot by the writings of uh, Eric von Dunnigan, uh, maybe also Velikovsky, I don't know. Um, however, the interpretation that some of these drawings are astronauts uh, is only an interpretation. We don't know what the person who made them actually was thinking at the time. It's simply a carving, and some people choose to interpret it as being an ancient astronaut of some sort. Now, what are alien sightings? What are UFOs? Mm -hmm. And we've covered this before, but let's try it again. Mm -hmm. If God's angels can take the form of human men in order to communicate with us and appear not to be monstrous, then Satan's fallen angels can also take the form of alien creatures, which are monstrous, in an attempt to convince us that uh, there are such creatures in other places, that evolution is true, and that the Bible is false, that there is no creator God. I mean, that's the objective. And again, if these uh, alien demonic spirits can form uh, the bodies of alien creatures to prove to people evidence that they want in order to be willingly deceived, they can also take the form of alien spacecraft. After all, when you think about some of the sightings of alien spacecraft that have been reported of, streaking across the sky at very high speeds at night and suddenly making a 90 degree turn, uh, that is impossible mm -hmm. in the natural realm. It is only possible in the supernatural realm. And so again, aliens and UFOs is demonic activity to provide evidence for people who want to be willingly deceived but it's for the purposes of preventing them from becoming Christians because that way Satan will be able to have them in hell with him which is what he's trying to achieve. Thank you very much for that Grady. Um, this one's coming in from, let's see who this one's coming, Amanda in, Amanda in Belfast. We're talking about vitamins including zinc uh, but I heard that zinc can be a toxic but I'm confused. What do you think, Dr. Grady? Any ideas on this one? Oh, yes. I'd be happy to give you ideas on that. I'm fairly knowledgeable when it comes to nutrition. Zinc is an essential thing for healing in the human body. So some zinc is beneficial. And occasionally some extra zinc for the purposes of, say, if you had a cold or the flu is beneficial. 
Uh, if you have an injury, zinc is important to help heal wounds, but it is toxic at higher levels. So you want to be very careful to never overdose with zinc. The same thing, however, I would point out is true of arsenic. Uh, you think of arsenic as a toxic poison, but the fact of the matter is we have to have a trace amount of arsenic in our bodies to live. Every living organism needs a trace amount of arsenic, but obviously at higher levels, it's toxic. So every one of these minerals, you have a, a certain amount of phosphorus in your body. Again, it's a trace amount, but it's necessary for life. But if you go too far, it'll kill you. Mm -hmm. So it's that old statement about moderation in all, all things. <laughs> mm. Yeah, for sure. Stephen in Carrick Fergus has written to say, hi, sighing Dr. Grady. It is my understanding that the Temple Mount Foundation stones are massive and very hard, but when, um, but when out of solid rock, it is actually very soft putty like rock. Can you explain this? And is this the reason why Hamas, etc., build so many tunnel systems? Well, first of all, if you're familiar with Jerusalem or Israel, if you've ever been there, you know that they have what they call a Jerusalem stone. It's a type of sedimentary rock that's rather dense. It makes a very good building material because it's soft enough to be cut with steel tools, with even bronze tools, but it is hard and firm and doesn't crack unless it's extreme pressure. And so it makes a very good building material and, and buildings and sidewalks, temple, mount, whatever, uh, use massive amounts of this particular kind of Jerusalem stone. So it's a very good sedimentary rock for building purposes. Soft enough to work, hard enough to have endurance. And so uh, you can even today see where these stones were quarried and how they were cut and then moved. Joe's written a very interesting question. Good evening, gentlemen. What jobs will be doing in heaven? Well, I can't tell you exactly what your job or my job is going to be, but the Bible is very specific that we will have useful work to do throughout an eternity future. Now, whether we're messengers or whether we're accomplishing some physical labor, I can't tell you. I can tell you that whatever it is is going to be perfect under the direction of God. This text message has come in to say, after Jesus said, follow me, a person asked the first was first asked to bury his father. Why did Jesus tell him to let the dead bury their dead and go preach the kingdom of God? Well, again, in that particular reference, is teaching an object lesson to the rich young ruler uh, and others who came along in terms of they wanted to follow Jesus, but said, but first we have to do something else. And remember the Bible tells us that once you have put your hand to the plow, and if you look back, you're not worthy of the kingdom. Now, Jesus wasn't saying that we shouldn't care for and bury our dead. He was saying that you've got to prefer him to doing those things. And so we have to separate the object lesson from a literal view of what he said. So again, he wasn't saying that you shouldn't bury your relatives when they die, but he was saying that if you have a preference for your relatives who have died versus me, you've got the wrong objective in your life mm -hmm. and that you are not following him. Interesting. Got another UFO question here, Grady, from Satinda. <laughs> I don't believe God oh, created life on other planets and there is nothing in the Bible to suggest that he ever did. However, I'd love to hear Dr. Grady's explanation of the UFOs spotted over Phoenix, Arizona in 1997. Well, I hate to point it out, but <laughs> alien spacecraft sightings have been seen over Arizona almost every year. Yeah. Um, the fact of the matter is though, let's talk about this life on other planet thing. Yeah. Now, I just said there were no alien life forms on any other planets, period. There's no alien spaceships. They aren't mm -hmm. zipping around at warp seven. Um, however, the Bible, and again, we must be careful. When the Bible is silent, we ought to remain silent. But the Bible does not prohibit the fact that God may have put planets out in solar systems that could be habitable. 
and that he put plants and animals there because the Bible says he decorates the universe for his own good pleasure. So if there were plants and animals living on planets someplace else, and I'm not saying there are, but if there were, it would not break any scripture. It is simply that there are no sentient beings on any other planets, period. And the Bible does preclude their existence. Now, in terms of alien sightings, we just talked about this in terms of its demonic activity used to deceive people who want to be deceived. Mm. I mean, what do you make of things like Hollywood and all these kind of films that are, are released, talks about UFOs and everything? Is this creating even more confusion with people and, and, uh, and, and giving the wrong information? What do you think? Well, I uh, have said in my personal presentations many times, never get your education from government-run television, National Geographic, The Learning Channel, Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, or Hollywood. <laughs> Hollywood, you know, these movies like Jurassic Park, they're not science, they're not science fiction, they're not even science fantasy. They are entertainment and propaganda. And even, even the people who made them would agree that the movies were not actually uh, consistent with the theory of evolution they were made to promote and support. Wonderful. We've got so many emails. Just want to encourage our viewers as well. We're live, we're interactive. Dr. Grady is with us tonight to take your questions live at revelationtv.com. Email details, uh, SMS details on screen. Linda's from uh, Wales has written in to us, Dr. Grady. says, can Dr. Grady explain what bodies the death in Christ will have while they have weight in the third heaven before they have long uh, been raptured, their glorified bodies? Well, again, you're talking about our existence in heaven after after death. Now we know that our spirit and our soul will be in heaven with the Lord as believers after death and the body goes into the ground. Again, Ecclesiastes chapter three. Uh, and God tells us that he will resurrect the body later, uh, both for the, those that are saved and those that are not in terms of judgment. Now, frankly, we cannot explain a glorified body. There are people who saw Jesus. Uh, there are people who saw Lazarus uh, after he was raised from the dead for the first time. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, we have no way of truly understanding what a glorified body is today. We have no examples of it. Okay, this one here, let's see what this next one. Peter's written in to say, uh, my question to the good doctor and brother Grady is, when did the Hebrews become Jews? And once that change took place, did they cease to be Hebrews? Well, they did not cease to be Hebrews. Uh, that's a misnomer. Now, the word Hebrew itself goes back to before Abraham. If you'll take a look at your Bibles and you take a look at the genealogy starting with Noah, you will find a man named Eber, E-B-E-R, or you might have a Bible translation that says H-E-B-E-R, Eber or Heber. And this is where the name Hebrew comes from. It predates Moses. It predates even Abraham. But that's where the name Hebrew comes from. But the Jews did not stop being Hebrews. And the word Jew comes from Judah. And of course, Judah, the tribe of kings, the tribe associated with Jerusalem and Benjamin, which is associated with Bethlehem, uh, these tribes, uh, of course, after the 10 tribes were taken into captivity, were the only two left. And because Judah was much larger than Benjamin, the name Judah became associated with the two tribes and was then changed into simply Jew. So the Jews didn't stop being Hebrews, and the name Jew comes from a much later period than Hebrew, but they're both. Okay, this one's from Janet. Janet's asking a question. Dear Dr. Grady, you must know that God works through the Philomacy sequence, a mathematical spiral. Elijah was taken up a whirlwind spiral. Do you think that we should be raptured in a spiral according to his perfect <laughs> mathematics? What do you think? 
Well, first of all, I've said before in the program, I don't answer hypothetical questions. Now, the profit was taken up in a whirlwind, which is, of course, a, a twisting spiral wind uh, when we think of a whirlwind. However, it would be absolutely inappropriate to answer questions of exactly how it's going to happen in the future until it happens and we know the description of it then. Stephen in Carrick Fergus says Robin Hood's Bay on the east coast of England is one of the coastal lands that are, fall are falling into the sea. On the west coast of Wales, Harlet Castle used to be by the Irish Sea, but it's at least a mile inland now. There's lots of lots to give and take and only two places in the UK. Global warming or change is rubbish. Stephen from Carrick Fergus, Northern Ireland. Well, I agree with him in the basics of that. Again, I've mentioned that along the North Sea coast, uh, we do know that England is eroding at about six feet a year on average where uh, things have, barriers have not been placed to protect the land. The same thing is true down in Kent and along the, the coast with the Cretaceous white cliffs. Um, where they're protected, they don't erode it nearly as fast but they are soft and they eventually do fall down and there is some erosion regardless. Uh, but in the areas where they're not protected, they erode much faster. They're being eaten out from below by the tidal action. And that, and, and I'm sorry to say that, frankly, I, <laughs> I hate the idea that England's disappearing. Mm -hmm. I, I would point out to everybody that the fact that England is eroding is a proof that the earth is young. Because if you take a look at the erosion along the North Sea coast and then take that erosion and extrapolate it for millions of supposed years, there'd be no England today. What do you make of the, the, the information and sometimes misinformation uh, with the wonders of the internet? There's so much pieces of information that people can read up and maybe confuse themselves with. And how, how, does, how have times changed? from let's say past the past decade, two decades, before we had the internet, the information was in our libraries, but now there's people seem to be poisoned or, or polluted with disinformation. What do you make of it? Well, I don't know the exact number, but I'm convinced that roughly 50% of what's on the internet is not true or specifically lies in order to deceive people. Uh, the fact of the matter is the Bible tells a study to show yourself approved. Uh, you're supposed to study for yourself. And study requires that we go back to original sources. Uh, people no longer are reading the original books that are written by authors. Instead, they're reading misquotes, misinformation, misinterpretations of the original materials. And one of the great things that I lament in the education system of the United States, and I lament in the education system of the UK, and every other nation in the world where evolution has become dominant is that we are no longer teaching critical thinking. Now, I grew up, again, being taught only evolution, but I did learn critical thinking as a scientist. And so what we need are people to go back to critical thinking, where you actually go back to original sources, you compare the thoughts on both sides, and on issues where faith is involved, mm -hmm. that by faith you're going to believe this one or that one. You have to think critically. You have to educate yourself on both sides, the pros, the cons, weigh the evidence, and then make your decision. Now that, for instance, applies to the question of origins, which is creation or evolution. Yeah. We shouldn't be simply memorizing material given to us by people who are not authoritative and who have a political agenda or personal agenda of some sort. So I would encourage everybody to go back to thinking critically and go back to reading original sources. Forget the internet stuff, because so much of it is either wrong, mm. lies, uh, intentional misinformation. Where is your main source of information when you do your research um, where do you look? What advice would you give to our viewers? Any specific areas? Well, I do look at various scientific publications that, where I review articles. I review articles from medicine to astrophysics. Yeah. Uh, 
And then I decide which ones I really want to find interesting. And I read the original articles. I read the original publications. I do not simply look at what the internet says about this particular thing or that particular thing. Yeah. I do a lot of research. I, I read a tremendous amount of articles, but these are peer related articles, both in evolution and in creation. I, you know, it's one of those things. If you came to my house and you looked at my library, which is rather extensive, yeah. uh, you would see that I have probably as many or more books by evolutionary authors as I do creation authors, because I have to know what the enemy is thinking. <laughs> I have to know what they're saying. And of course, I look at the scientific research and articles that are being published on recent findings, such as soft tissues, blood, proteins in dinosaur fossils, which cannot possibly be millions and millions of years old, proving that they died in a worldwide flood only 4,500 years ago. And what I do is I look at what they find, I look at the way they try to spin to the public's uh, you know, consumption, uh, their view, their worldview, and then I take a look at the reality of what they found and I can then prove creation. Dylan in Northern Ireland's written in our regular viewer. Dylan, Dylan, hope you're well. Um, and he's asking, Dr. Grady, please let us know what is on your godly mind tonight. So is there anything in particular <laughs> on your heart tonight, Grady? Well, I hadn't come to, to particularly make a monologue out of this. You know, it's, just, it's a dialogue with Q&A. I would say that we continuously, continuously find new scientific information that proves creation and refutes evolution. Today, we have over 350 scientific geochronometers. Again, when we take a look at natural law, the churl nature of isomers, we take a look at soft tissues found in fossils supposedly up to 500 million years old. I mean, uh, the, the list is literally endless. Polystrate fossils. We can go anywhere and everywhere, and we can tend to learn new things, which is what God commanded us to do. Genesis chapter one, the creation mandate. We are to study the things that God did in order to then help others. And that's why we should be doing it. And those are the kinds of things that are on my mind. Of course, I lament, again, the state of education being so bad, being nothing but memorization instead yeah. of critical thinking. What would you do different, Grady, if you were in government? How would you change uh, the way that our children are being educated? Well, the problem is that education has become politicized. You know, <clears throat> obviously I was trained as an evolutionist. Uh, you know, I taught evolution. Uh, I had science degrees in evolution, became a teacher of evolution, believed it, taught it. But because I was willing to learn, I was willing to change. At the age of 27, I became a Christian in a search for truth when I found that truth was a person and not a concept. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. okay, if I were in control, I have three solutions to the problem of teaching evolution only in, in government-run education. So the first one is we ought to teach creation and evolution side by side, scientifically, no Bible, no theological argumentation whatsoever, just the science mm -hmm. that supports creation, the science that supports evolution, treat them equally, scientifically. Again, that's critical thinking. Allow okay. the student to decide which one they will believe. Because yep. if you did that, I believe we'd have 90% creationists and 10% evolutionists. Mm -hmm. The second solution is uh, don't teach evolution at all. Don't teach creation don't teach evolution, just teach science. After all, one reason that the world's economy and the world's countries are slowing down is simply because of the teaching of evolution instead of the teaching of simple science. Because if we taught our students the laws of thermodynamics and, and just real science, we would advance at a much higher rate. Yeah because evolution slows this down. Mm -hmm. My third solution would be, if you're not going to teach them equally, scientifically, if you insist on teaching evolution instead of teaching science, what you need to do is you need to teach more about evolution than they already do, because if you taught everything, nobody believe it. You see, they censure the science 
that proves that evolution is not true. They only show you what they think supports their position. They tell you fairy tales for adults around it to make it seem plausible, logical. But remember that all things which are logical and plausible are not necessarily true. Very interesting. Thank you for that, Grady. John's written in to say, good evening, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. I have very recently heard of a nanoparticle substance called graphene oxide and dangerous for humans. It is also said that it was included in COVID. Um, what do you think? Is this true or not? Any comments would be appreciated. I am not aware that it was involved with COVID whatsoever, but that substance has a lot of very good uses in terms of the construction of things. So it's not all bad. However, however, used improperly, it could be hazardous. So it's like any other technology. Uh, it's a really interesting find. It is useful for many things, but it can also be used positively as well as negatively. And so technology is neutral. It's what you do with it that makes it good or bad. Okay, Helen's written in to say hi. So can you please ask Dr. Grady, is there any vitamins I can take for titanus? I wish I could tell you a good answer to that question. Unfortunately, um, we really haven't found a good treatment for that. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with it, that's ringing in the ears. Um, obviously, there are some things that we find that might have a little benefit, but nothing that we've found is a cure. TJ's written a question here saying, hi, sign Dr. Grady. Why is it so important to know the age of the earth? It is, not, is it not possible to have different explanation that's neither 6,000 or 13.5 billion years old? It doesn't seem to bother me. Maybe I'm missing something. Thank you from TJ. Well, TJ, you have to remember the age of the earth is not the salvation issue. So somebody can believe in an old earth, old universe and still go to heaven because it's not the salvation issue. I would like to give you the latest number because you're a little behind. Today, evolutionists claim that the universe is 13.82 billion years old, not 13.5. However, I can assure you that as we develop new instruments in astronomy, they'll simply make it older and older. The number never stays the same for long. However, the age of the Earth and the universe is not the salvation issue, but it is critical to the gospel. And here's why. If the Earth and the universe were old, the people who want to believe that it's old, why would they want to? You see, the Earth is not old. We can prove it's scientifically young. The Bible tells us it was created 6,000 years ago. So on biblical authority alone, if you were to assume that the Bible is inerrant, uh, those millions and billions of years are not true. Now, for those Christians and non-Christians who want to believe in millions and billions of years, why do they want to believe it? It's because they want to believe that life and death have been going on for millions and billions of years. Now, if that were true, if life and death had been going on for millions and billions of years, then you negate the power of the cross whether you understand that or not, whether you meant to intentionally or not, because the Bible tells us that death of a nefesh organism, a nefesh organism has a soul. That's any of the higher animals and people. But the Bible tells us that any creature which has the breath of life, the nefesh soul, well, didn't die until after human sin, the first sin of Adam. Paul is quite specific about this, for instance, in Romans 5, and again in 1 Corinthians 15, that no nefesh organism died before human sin. Now, if you believe in millions and billions of years, you do it only in order to believe that life and death have been going on for millions and billions of years, such as dinosaurs, but they are nefesh organisms. So what you're saying is that death came into the universe without human sin as the cause of agents, that death is simply a normal process of nature. And if that is true, then the death of Christ on the cross was meaningless. It's just another death. It's only when we understand that God created whole, complete, and perfect 6,000 years ago. Put one man and one woman there, Adam and Eve, and 
gave them the right to mess things up, and they did. Mm -hmm. And that because of that, and only that, death came into the universe, that then, then you can understand how the death of one sinless man on the cross, Jesus Christ, can atone for the sins of the world. So if the first Adam didn't cause sin and death, then the second Adam can't take it away. And so it's not the salvation issue, but it's critical to the gospel. Wonderful. Grady, we've got so many emails still. We've got about nine minutes to go. Elaine's written in to say, Good evening, gentlemen. A highly respected evangelist said yesterday he believes uh, soul sleep. And yet, as you mentioned earlier, our Lord Jesus promised the thief on the cross he would be with him in paradise that day. What is your own opinion, Dr. Grady? And bless you both. Soul sleep is a concept that we find in the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Now, I want to say this very clearly. Conservative Seventh-day Adventists are Christians. They'll go to heaven. However, they have certain doctrines or beliefs within their denomination, such as soul sleep, which is inconsistent with Scripture, and uh, we simply have to love them and say we disagree with that particular concept. It's not biblically supportable. The reason that they believe it is simply because of a translation where Paul used a euphemism. Don't worry about the dead, they're simply asleep. He wasn't actually meaning that they were asleep in the ground. He was using an expression that though dead, they would be resurrected later mm -hmm. in the body. Yet the soul and the spirit has already gone on to wherever it's going to go. Again, I quote Ecclesiastes 3 and 12. Uh, again, Paul, and there are many others. But the fact of the matter is, the concept of soul sleep is, is not consistent with the scripture. It's built on an English translation, and you should never, ever do that, because when you build a doctrine on a translation, rather than the original language and its original intent, you're going to make a mistake. But that does not prevent a conservative Seventh-day Adventist from going to heaven, simply because they're wrong on a particular point. Grady, you're doing amazingly well getting through this. We've still got a lot of emails to go. We've got about six and a half minutes to go. Let's see what we can do. Cynthia's written in to say, why do people say they have seen Jesus when in Matthew 11:27 it says, no one has seen the Father except the Son, and no one has seen the Son except the Father? You have to remember that we must separate. You have to rightly divide the word. Jesus speaks sometimes as God and sometimes as man. Jesus is the theanthropos. Mm -hmm. The theanthropos. Theos is God. Theology is the study of God. Anthropos is man. Anthropology is the study of man. And Jesus is the theanthropos. He's the God-man. He's 100% God and 100% man. And he is perfectly capable of absolutely speaking as God in certain times and places, and as man only in others. And we must rightly divide the word, or we must read it correctly. Now, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were in a perfect family unit for eternity past. They didn't need us. They didn't create the physical universe for themselves. But at some point, they decided it appropriate and right to create the physical universe, to create us in God's image, not his physical image, but in his spiritual image, and to allow us for salvation to be then with them. And we were created to voluntarily worship God for who he is, not for what he does, and to reproduce and therefore bring more people into the kingdom. Now, that's why we were created, those two purposes. So when God says, no one's seen the Father but the Son, and no one's seen the Son but the Father, he's referring to the Godhood. Now, he's not referring to the manhood. Because remember, on earth, he said, if you've seen me in my physical body, if you've listened to my teachings and accepted them 100%, then you have seen the Father also, because we are one. They are not two separate entities. Triune God means the three in one. It's one God mm -hmm. in three relationships. Mm -hmm. 
Brian's ridden in to say, we've got about four minutes to go, Grady. Brian's ridden in to say, uh, does Dr. Grady know if God gave Noah particular measurements for the ark for any other reason other than it was for the most stable shape for a vessel in a seaway? That's from Brian. Great question. I talk about this in my presentations. You know, there, we did a DVD presentation with Revelation on the ark. And God is a perfect marine architect. The ark is a perfect floating object for survival in a worldwide flood. I, I can't begin to answer the question shortly and give you all the details, but a six to one ratio automatically turns into a wave. It sank halfway into the water. The center of gravity was so low, it couldn't capsize. I mean, there's, there's so many things about the ark, and the ark is also a biblical typology of Christ in the church. But God is a perfect marine architect, and he gave the architectural drawings to Noah, and Noah built it for 100 years, and it was perfect. This question's coming. We've got about two and a half minutes left, Grady. What, uh, good evening to you both. What is Noah is, Noah, Noahism, Noahism. Do you know what that is? Well, can you spell that to make sure? N N O A H I D I S M. Yeah, I think I I think I know what they're talking about, but it's a false concept if I re, if I'm correct about what they mean. But I would really want to interview them and ask the question to be sure I knew their definition. Ian's written in to say, we've got about two and a half minutes, Grady, doing great. Ian's written in to say, hi, Grady, why is Greenland called Greenland? Is it because it was green when it was first discovered, thus proving climate changes anyway? What do you think? Well, first of all, Greenland was green at one time. Greenland was green from creation to the flood, just to start with. Now, Iceland did not exist before the flood. Iceland came into existence during and after the flood. But Greenland was green, and it was still green immediately after the flood. Now, the polar ice cap on Greenland has been drilled through by American scientists, and underneath the ice, we actually found leaf litter and dead insects. Now, the description and the name Greenland given by the Vikings, you know, when they went to Greenland, they called it green, although it was actually good marketing not entirely true. However, the Vikings went there at just the right time in human history. The medieval warm period started about 850 and lasted until about 1250. And during that time, Greenland was so warm that air, land existed where they could grow crops and raise animals. And so the early explorers came back to Denmark and said, it's green, we can populate it, and they were telling the truth. But because the medieval warm period ended, and we went into what is called the Little Ice Age, which lasted from about 1250 to 1895, um, what happened was the summers became so short and okay. so cold, they could no longer raise crops, and they Grady. had to abandon their colony. We have come towards the end of tonight's program. Just want to say a big thank you. And just to finish on this last email, it says, this Dylan's written into Cynthia. Now, viewers are writing to each other saying, well said, Cynthia, I believe Jesus has been sitting on the right hand of the God constantly for over 2,000 years and ruling heaven and earth from his throne. So we just want to say it's lovely to see our viewers are also interacting with each other through emails and SMS. Excellent. Before we finish, Grady, tell our viewers about your website in 20 seconds. Creation Worldview. We have over 100 free articles. We have 285 free short videos. We have a whole bookstore. We have a YouTube channel. You can go there. You can see all these things for free. Brilliant. The fact of the matter is, it's a great resource. Okay? Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Dr. Grady. Thank you also to our viewers. So much answers have been answered by Dr. Grady. Go onto our website to watch this repeat, revelationtv.com. Take care. God bless. Thank you so much, Dr. Grady. God bye. Bye bye.